All right, every week for the last eight weeks, A&E and WWE have been producing this incredible biography series that has been coming out on Sunday nights. And this Sunday is no different. It has been diving into the lives and the careers of some of the greats of all time. Today on Wrestling, I'm very, very pleased to have one of the very greatest of all time, one of the legends of the game, somebody that you can watch all about on A&E this weekend. It is the great... Boy, I, I just, I can't even look at you. It is the great Bret Hart. Thank you very much, Bret, for being here. Uh, my pleasure. So, listen, I, I don't know who will watch this on Sunday night, but there will be a lot of people that have the opportunity to watch the documentary about Bret Hart and learn about your life and your career. And I just want to ask you up front, what do you, as you sit here today in 2021, what is Bret Hart's legacy that you want to get across? Um... I think just how um, passionate I was, maybe. Um, you know, I really prided myself, and and you know, I think I believed nobody believed it more in me than I did. Like, I really believed that I um, was at, when I was at when I was champion. I was the champion because I was the best, and um, and it, it was a very you know, when you look at the history of wrestling, you know, I think when I, when I came into power kind of thing, or when I came into had my chance to, to make a difference, it was a, it was a tough time in, in wrestling. It was sort of, I've always used the example of who was going to pull the sword out of the stone with uh, Hulk Hogan and everything that had happened in the, in the eighties had sort of transpired and, and wrestling was kind of going through this uh, with, different scandals and stuff that were happening in WWE at the time. It was just kind of going through a downtrend and right. it was kind of like, who do we go to? How do we stop everything from kind of going down? And I believe that uh, I was the guy that pulled the sword out of the stone. I think I was just what they needed at that time. I needed to, I took wrestling and I wasn't, I wasn't like Hulk Hogan. I wasn't like the ultimate warrior. I wasn't like Macho Man. I think I sort of brought a different quality to that, to the, to the, to the position. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I made a difference. I don't know that anybody could have made the same difference that I did at the time. I know, I know Sean was coming up, Sean Michaels, um, and there was no stopping him. And I know Steve Austin was coming up. There was no stopping him and even the rock and every, the next generations were coming. But I feel like when I was champion, it was at a very critical time in, 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 the, in the industry. And uh, it was not an easy job to fill it and try to, to kind of save the business from, from falling uh, any farther down than it had. And I think that's where the rebuild came back. And, you know, wrestling went from, you know, for lack of a better word, the freak shows of like, you know, Andre and Hogan, these big, large men to a focus when I was champion, it was on a focus on, um, on technique and wrestling and, uh, storytelling. And, sure. and, and then that's, that's what I was all about. I was a storyteller. I was a guy that I like to pride myself and I still do. I think you know, when I think of the guys that I worked with, um, most of the guys that I worked with that had their best matches with me would tell me, and I still remember them all, whether it was my brother Owen or it was Roddy Pipe or whether it was Stone Cold, that they had their greatest match with me, mm -hmm. period. Of all the matches that they had in their great careers, like I know Roddy Piper loved the, the WrestleMania 8 match we had. I know my brother Owen loved um, you know, WrestleMania 10. and You know, I could just go on and on about how to me, everyone was, um, it was a certain pride that went into to the matches that I had with certain guys. And, uh, you know, I, I, I still think that, um, you know, just about any match that I had of any consequence, you know, they, they stand out as, um, you know, flawless matches. I, you know, I, I always was in the right place at the right time in my matches. And, you know, above all things, I can say that, um, my greatest pride is in the fact that I was a really safe wrestler. Sure. You know, I wrestled for, for 21 years 
and never hurt one wrestler ever in any kind of physical way where they couldn't do their job the next day. And uh, you watch my matches back and you see how physical and sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, tight, the wrestling wrestle was really tight stuff, like the punches, the kicks, the drop kicks in the face, the back breakers, everything was so solid looking. And uh, to take pride in knowing that no wrestlers were harmed in the making of any of those movies um, is, a, is a, you know, as it says it all, I think, exemplify in the ring. There's so much I want to ask you about, but I, I want to start with this. Uh, when you talk about somebody's legacy, you probably do talk about when they were the world champ, but I consider you one of the great WWF tag champions, WWE tag champions of all time. I consider you one of the great intercontinental champions of all time. So there was like that st stair step, that process of you just elevating every belt that you got to. How important were those two titles to your maturation as a wrestler? Uh, it was all, you know, when we were tag champions, the very first time we won the belts, um, I can remember saying, Jim, we are the champions of the world. We are the I cried, best. I, I cried when you won that because you were heels and you, you upset me, but it's okay. <laughs> no, I'll, you know, um, it was probably not our finest match, you know, especially with the Bulldogs. You know, being honest, I think we would love to have had a match with them under better circumstances, but Dynamite being hurt the way he was. And, you know, but we, you know, even that, you know, even that very small example, Hart Foundation against the Bulldogs when we won the tag belts. Dynamite was so injured, so hurt, he could barely do anything other than walk out to the ring. But if you ever watch that match, you'll see how, how we were such professionals to protect Dynamite the way we did and to not hurt him in any way and still – pass the titles on and uh you know the skill involved with uh, just how we handled dynamite is something to to look back on and go that's that's amazing what what we did in that match uh um to to wrestle the way we did to somebody that could was so so badly injured beyond what people can imagine that he could barely walk out there and uh you know, even when we finished that match and Jim and I came back to the dressing room um, after we won the titles, you know, there was wrestlers that cried in the dressing room, <clears throat> watching Dynamite come back to the dressing room, knowing how much pain he was in and how hard, what a great, you know, what a heart that he had to go out there and do what he did. Um, you know, that's the kind of emotion you get. Um, it's a rare thing in this business when, when all the wrestlers stand back there and clap for, for a guy to, to do that. And um, it was, a, it was a, something that was really special to all of us. And Jim and I, you know, we, we were a great team. I've, I think that um, we really complimented each other. We were one of those few teams that uh, could wrestle any team. You know, we were very versatile. We could wrestle Andre and Haku. We could wrestle the Rockers. We could wrestle the Demolition. We could wrestle any team mixed together, big guys, small guys, strong guys. You know, like we were really versatile. And, you know, even like you said, going back to the Intercontinental days, um, you know, I always think, and I think it's fair to say that the Intercontinental title was kind of the wrestler's title. Mm -hmm. That was the one where it's like, you're going to be, you're getting this title because of the history of the great wrestlers, often better wrestlers than the champion, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Pat Patterson or Pedro Morales or Don Morocco or, or Mr. Perfect, you know, they were all, you know, they all raised the bar and they were guys that were respected with or without the title. But once that they had that title, this is the wrestler's title. This is the one that, uh, basically means you're a technical wrestler and uh, that you can wrestle anybody. And so the Intercontinental, I mean, when I think about, you know, Roddy Piper, Mr. Perfect, even uh, Bulldog, um, I had so many great matches that um, started to pave the way for me. I believe that the match I had with Perfect was the first real classic Bret Hart match. At SummerSlam 91 in the Garden? Yeah. I think it was the first one that people went, wow, that was, that's a, that's one for the ages. Like we we're never going to forget that one. And then it's like, next thing you wrestle Roddy Piper. And it's like, now he's got two classic matches. He's had two, you know, 
incredible matches. And then Wembley after that was uh, when I worked with Bulldog. Uh, that was a home run, um, like in the sense that, you know, I know that amongst wrestlers and, and fans that that was the match that really stood out for, for everybody. And I think that was – that paved the way to become the world champion. It was like yeah. – um, a recognition that um, what I was doing in wrestling was telling better stories than anyone else. And um, that's why I got in the position I got. And then it was, then it was kind of a weight on your back to constantly create or, or have the greatest matches if possible with everybody that you work with, try to give them their best performance. And uh I believe whether it was one, two, three kid or Kevin Nash or um, Scott Hall or, or Steve Austin, or whoever I, whoever I went up against, I always try to bring out the absolute best in them and tell the best story possible. And, uh, and I think I've been starting to become, that's, that was my MO. Like that was what, that's what stood out for people. I became famous for my storytelling. We are talking to uh, the great Bret Hart, former WWE champion. We're talking to uh, to him because this Sunday uh, on A&E, the biography series continues with the, the, the great series talking about the careers and lives of these great uh, WWE legends. I want to go back to 1989. I was 10 years old. My mother took me to my first WWF house show back then, and it was in Huntsville, Alabama. And Randy Savage and Beefcake were on top. Andre the Giant was on the card. But there was a match in the middle, 1989, between Mr. Perfect and Bret the Hitman Hart. They went to a, You guys went to a 20-minute draw. I'm sure you did it around the house shows. You did a 20-minute draw, and you wanted five more minutes, and he wouldn't give it to you and stuff like that. But that was the day that I connected with Bret Hart as a fan. And it was the day that I connected with wrestlers. Like, like I, I decided there was all this uh, pizzazz on the show, but these two guys just wrestled a straight match, and it made me fans of you and Kurt Henning for the rest of my life. Well, I'll always say this about Kurt. If I could wrestle one guy again, um, yeah. it would have been Kurt. He was my favorite opponent ever. Um, and my brother Owen's a close second, but uh, – you know, we were at such a, a bond and a, and a chemistry together that um, whenever we went out there, um, no matter what the circumstances, no matter how you traveled that day, whether you got stuck at an airport for eight hours and you were like, you know, completely wiped when you got to the dressing room. I can remember a lot of times with Kurt, it was like, we get ready to go out there and it's like... Um, I got nothing in the tank. I'm completely burned out. I'm exhausted. And you go out there, the crowd starts to cheer. And within about five minutes, you're just giving them a, a five-star match. You're laying out all the stops. You, you give them everything that, that you have. And um, I was like that with Kurt. Uh, and I think there was a, a growing respect that we started to have for each other. Um, you know, Kurt, really loved working with me and I love working with Kurt and you know if you really look at my my rise to the top it all starts with Kurt Henning um, he was the guy that uh, even though he was injured too uh, with his back um, he was never going to miss SummerSlam because he wanted to do that for me he wanted to help uh, elevate me to the next level and uh, you know I, I had such a, a respect for Kurt um, and, uh, and, uh, we had such a great friendship and, uh, he's one of those guys that, uh, I never forget for, for that first match and, and trusting me and, and being there for me and sacrificing so much with his back injury. He could have just said, you know what, I, I can't make it that day. And, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take a few more months off or, you know, but he came back specifically and he came back hurt to, to, to deliver that match with me. I want to ask about two more matches, and, uh, and then i got another question. But uh, one match I want to ask you about, you already mentioned it. It's one of my favorites. I think it's a very underappreciated match, and it's WrestleMania Eight. It's against Rowdy Roddy Piper. Uh, he's got the belt. You come into the, the Hoosier Dome there in Indianapolis, and you guys do a pre-match promo where you're, you're both, you know, you're both good guys. You're both faces, but you do a pre-match promo to, to, like, tease some dissension and then you go out there and Piper for about 15 minutes has this uh, building heel turn throughout the match. And ultimately he decides not to hit you with the bell. Who came up with that story? That was Roddy's Roddy, Roddy, Roddy gets full marks for, for, 
you know, we, we, we worked out the match um, very roughly. Um, we didn't see, we weren't funny. I didn't see Roddy a whole lot in those days. He was on one circuit and I was on another circuit. And then we did get to meet each other. I believe it was in Moncton, New Brunswick, of all places, um, right. where we could like, let's sit down and sort of talk about the match and start to put this match together. And, you know, I was kind of dreading it in a sense, like, because I, I loved Roddy and I was very close with Roddy. And then I started to worry, like, what if Roddy gives me a bunch of really lousy ideas and I don't like it? Like, how do I tell a guy that I love and have so much respect for that I don't like that idea? You know, it was a very, it was kind of an awkward, I hadn't been in those that situation really very many times where it's like, do you speak up or do you not speak up or do you say, hey, you know, that's, that's really lame. I don't want to do anything like that. Or this is what I need to do. You know, and I was very, a kind of a control freak too. You know, I, I, I had a sort of set idea of how I thought the match should go. And so we sat down and there was a restaurant in uh, New Brunswick. And I remember it's like, so what do you think? And then I said, like, Roddy goes like, this is what I have in mind. This is what I was thinking. And he started telling me his ideas, of how he thought the match should go and the pace of it. And anyway, we had the exact same script. Like, like we had the exact same. I remember when I listened to it, it's like, I'm in agreement with all of that. Like everything. Let's do it exactly like that. That's exactly what I was thinking. And Without without flushing out all the details of how what the story was going to be, just sort of the arc of the story, and that it was it was very harmonious and very and Roddy and, and like Mister Perfect, Roddy was the guy that was um, going to open the door for me. You know, he was going to hold the door open for me to help me get me to the next level. And uh, you know, a lot of wrestlers hadn't done that for me and some would never do that for me um but roddy was a guy that was like that's what i love about roddy he was a guy that was kind of trying to open the door for the next generation it was an old you know there's a lot of guys like hogan and jake roberts and sure. warrior and guys like that that never held the door for anybody you know as soon as as soon as their careers ended they slammed the door shut and never did anything for anybody and um uh, for whatever reasons, but I mean, Roddy Piper was a guy that had opened the door for the next generation. And, uh, I never forget that. And, uh, I, as far as the match went, um, you know, even the, the pinning thing at the end with the sleeper hold and me pushing off the top turnbuckle with my feet, right. That was a move that Roddy thought of or created, or, you know, cause I'd never seen it done anywhere else, but he, he came up with that idea. And I can remember saying it's okay, you know, like I'm all for it, I get it, and we can do that. And it would maybe be great if we could do that. But I'm a 240 pound man. Yeah. Pushing off the top turnbuckle and you got your hands wrapped around my neck. And all I can do is a 240 pound man falling with all his weight on your face from that height, straight back. You can't break your fall because your arms are around my, you got a sleeper hold on me. I remember saying, I said, it's a dangerous move. Like, you know, you could, I could break your neck or at least break your nose and knock all your teeth out or something. You know, it's going to be a, that's a hard fall to take. And whenever I watch it back, I go, you know, you watch how Roddy takes that bump flat on his back, all my weight right on his face. And it's just, it's a it's a gutsy call and it was a, a very generous uh, thing that, that he did for me in that match and uh i loved i love the match i love it's always and, and i always what i pride myself on with um uh, with both mr perfect and with uh, roddy pipers they always told me that both the SummerSlam and the wrestlemania were their favorite matches of all time that they ever had and uh, that means the world to me so you mentioned another guy earlier, plus you mentioned holding the door open for the next guys. Stone Cold Steve Austin became one of the biggest stars in the history of the business, but Stone Cold doesn't become that without WrestleMania 13, or at least not to that level. It certainly gave him a boost. Um, this match has been talked about 
ad nauseum. I'm sure you've been asked about it many, many, many times. My question about this match with Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 13, when you did the double turn, when did you guys know, all right, we have this, we're, we are nailing this. Was it at the end or was it in the middle? When, when did you figure out this one is going very, very well? Um, you know, I would say it was before we ever went out. Okay. Yeah. yeah I would say it was a trust. Me and Steve had worked a few times. We worked at Survivor Series not that long before that. And then Another anything, we were, match. It was a great match and often sort of overlooked by people how good it was. It was a really good match. And uh, But, you know, when we got thrown together, it was kind of, you know, it was it – was, it wasn't the match I was expecting. I was expecting Wrestle Sean for the title. Right. And, you know, I wasn't, I, was, I loved the idea of working with Steve, but I didn't like the idea of working with him so quickly right after Survivor Series. Really, this is like, you know, four months later, we're wrestling again. And, then, you know, the limitations of the I quit match or, you know, only made it harder. Like Steve, I remember Steve kind of saying, I'm not a submission guy. Yeah. I don't have a lot of submission holds. And I'm kind of going, well, I got the sharpshooter. I can put figure four on. There's a sleeper hole. There's, there's a certain a certain resume of holds that you can sort of go to. But I, I mean, I was a technical wrestler. I could, I could go for a lot of different holds. But really, when you take the pinfalls out of a match, it makes it harder to tell a good story because you don't have those false finishes. And so... I wasn't very excited about the match. I was, if anything, I was a little bit frustrated that it had been thrown together. So, you know, ad hoc sort of just thrown together within a few weeks of WrestleMania. It's like, it's you and Steve again in a I quit matches. I really like an I quit match that I always hated the concept of the I quit matches. It just was, like I say, you take out all the pinfalls and pinfalls are what make a match so exciting. And uh, so I wasn't very excited about working with Steve. And I don't know that Steve felt any different either. I was going through a metamorphosis and I was going to change to a, to a bad guy. Yeah. Which only kind of got my head around within a few days of that. I mean, it's like, Oh, okay. So I'm going to be a bad guy. And like I said, we weren't very excited about, um, doing this match and I remember we but with kind of that day of the show we kind of walked out to the ring and we sat around the ring and kind of just kind of looked at the ring and said this is what I think and we started to piece this match together and you know once we kind of talked it through like the the fact is that I I had a lot of respect for Steve I loved working with Steve. He was one of my favorite guys to work with at that time. And I, I do, I could really trust Steve to, to work with me side by side and build this match together. And uh, I knew we had great chemistry and we, we really kind of pieced just a, a sort of a rough sketch of how we thought the match should go. And it just, you know, it was like magic. You know, I, I think it's, stands to me as my all-time maybe my all-time greatest match because of the um you know just i think the restrictions really of having an i quit match and you know we we told such a good story like when i watch that match back today and i know steve will often watch it back and we sometimes talk to each other but you know like there's not one move that's out of place like everything in the match, it builds to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. It's so, such an interesting sort of um, climb to the to the to the climax at the end, and such a great storytelling experience. Like any young wrestler, I I don't know that I've ever seen a match ever that duplicates that kind of storytelling. And then, you know, if you took out you know, any of the moves that we did and put them in a different order and a different time, it wouldn't have been the same. It's everything builds perfectly. Right. And, um, and I think it was a defining moment for Steve. I mean, I, I'll never say that Steve was, Steve was destined for great things in the wrestling. He didn't need me or matches with me to, to do that. But um, I will say, I think it, it really opened the door for Steve. Like it was like his character was sort of formed 
that night mm-hmm. and was starting to form even at the Royal Rumble when he double crossed me at the Rumble. And there was a lot of things that Steve, even the Survivor Series match, were starting to form Steve Austin and what he was to become. But the WrestleMania 13 match really, you know, just uh, a, like made it in stone. And uh, he was, he was, he was a made guy after that night. And it's and it, cause he had all that ability and talent anyway. And, but I, I've, you know, I've often said to people that have never watched wrestling or don't know much about it. It's like, well, here, watch this match, you know, and they, it's, um, it's a moving experience and it's, it's as good or better than any UFC fight. It's as good as any good movie. I mean, it's just a, uh, it's a, it's a brilliant performance by two great wrestlers in their front. It's, uh, I have it as the greatest WrestleMania match of all time. It's one of my all time favorite matches, period, uh, regardless of company, regardless of anything. I, I just love it. I know you, you probably got to move along very, very soon because you got a lot going on uh, with this AE biography coming up Sunday. I got one more question for you. Looking at uh, current wrestling, I, I look at somebody like Roman Reigns, and he is in the hottest groove of his career. He's found his character, he's found everything he wants to do. What do you consider the hottest period of your career when you were just nailing it, when you were everything you wanted to be? What was what was the peak of your career in your eyes? Maybe not a match, maybe just a time period. Um, well, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but I would have to say 97. You know, yeah, really. The U.S. Canada would, stuff, the Stone Cold match with, with all those? I just, yeah, I think when I look back on that period, Right where we were just talking with Steve Austin, WrestleMania right. 13. You know, I was trying so hard to deliver the great matches that I was, I started to have a reputation for. Like a lot of people throw around the, the term classic. Mm-hmm. Oh, he had a classic. It's only a classic if somebody remembers it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if it's, you know, I hear a lot of people talk, oh, he, this was a classic. And I go, well, I've never seen it. I've never heard about it. I don't know. No one's ever talked to me about this match between so-and-so and so-and-so. You know, you, you look back on, you know, matches going back to the 80s and 90s. And, um, you know, the word classic's not thrown around so much. Whereas um, in 97, I had had a history of delivering these classic matches. Um, Piper, Perfect, you know, like different ones. Classics. And I think that I was in my peak in 97, where it was like artistically, uh, emotionally, um, physically, I was at the best of my game. And like when I think of when I wrestled Steve, going out to the ring and trying to piece together how this match might work. And uh, it was like, I know exactly how the match should go. This is what we need to do. And me laying out a story for the match is basically what we did and it's the same with undertaker and then summer slam right. um, the, the, the big show that the in your house pay-per-view in calgary the stampede show with uh, pillman and all one davy and everybody it was one after another like I, I feel like they were all home runs you know even wrestling uh, vader i think or um, the patriot different guys that i worked with they were great matches great performances great tension in the ring and uh you know i think even unfortunately this the screw job match was on par to be a, a absolute classic would have been one of the greatest matches sean and i ever had you know we we fought 10 or 15 minutes on the floor before the bell even rang yeah and then we went in the ring and gave about 10 minutes of what was going to be a maybe a 35 minute match that was going to blow people away and just going to like i was I wanted to have the greatest match that Sean ever had that night. And, uh, you know, I, I look back to that time period and that's, that's what I was trying to do. Um, and I believe that, uh, no, at no time in my career was I telling better stories at that time. I was like, I really, maybe it was the heel role, you know, being the bad guy and having all those experience, all that experience from years before with the anvil. You know, when we were bad guys, we were bad guys at the a very uh, touchy time in the business when uh, wrestling was like 
with that old time heat they call like you know when i watched the documentary on roddy you you start to remember how fans would try to stab you and you know you like when you went back to the dressing room after cheating the bulldogs in a match people would want to kill you and, and lynch you like and if they could uh, fight through the security and get to you you know people punching you and trying to throw stuff at you and bottles and stuff flying over your head was a different kind of heat in those days like you know when you were a bad guy you had really intense heat and, um, you know i think i had that experience with jim you know being on earlier cards and like when roddy piper had that kind of intense heat too and certain guys in the business right um i just think all of that paid off in 97 because i had such a um such experience with um being a bad guy and knowing what buttons to push and how to push them and here let's let me go let me go out there and uh and and pave the way for you know great matches and uh i i I just think that was when i was in my prime i could sit here and talk to you about wrestling for the next three hours but i know you got to go we got to keep a tight schedule um so i i just want to thank you for your time and i want to tell everybody again uh this sunday night biography we get to Brett the Hitman Hart, and it's going to be fantastic. It's on A and E. It's been a great series, and this will be just a a fantastic use of your time Sunday night. Brett, thank you very much for being on wrestling. All right, thank you very much. All right, that is Brett the Hitman Hart, one of the great world champs ever, one of the great IC champs ever, one of the great tag champs, and this is wrestling. <laughs>